Twitter, Taylor Swift, and the Uber effect. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 364 for Monday, June 22nd, 2015. This show is sponsored by NatureBox. NatureBox ships snacks right to your door with over 100 flavors to choose from, like mini Belgian waffles. You will never get bored of snacking again. Try NatureBox at naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney. Joining me today to talk Twitter and Taylor Swift is Kurt Wagner from Recode. Welcome back, Kurt. Hi, Megan. How's it going? It's going well. So Twitter is still a company in transition, and it's not going very smoothly. Today, the company felt the need to publicly clarify that their open CEO gig is, in fact, a full-time job. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us why the board made this announcement. Well, I think that a lot of people have been speculating for probably good reason over the last couple weeks since they announced that Dick uh, Costello is going to be stepping down, that Jack Dorsey may become the new CEO, and uh, he's the interim CEO and uh, obviously the co-founder of Twitter, but he's also running another company by the name of Square, which is a pretty big, uh, although it's private, a pretty big private company. And so I think that um, it's a little bit confusing here because they say, hey, just FYI, being the CEO of Twitter is surprise, a full-time job, and we expect someone to commit to that uh, totally. At the same time, it's not entirely clear whether or not that means that they're eliminating Jack Dorsey from contention for the position or just simply saying if we were to give it to him he would have to give up running uh, square because you know let's think about it it probably wouldn't be very easy to run those two companies even though the offices are about 50 yards from one another um, so I think what they were simply trying to do was saying hey don't worry if we hire Jack this is going to be his priority and then if we don't hire Jack whoever else we hire is not going to be running another company at the same time uh, shareholders, you can rest easy that whoever takes his job is going to make it their top priority. Now, Chris Saka, he's a big investor, a longtime Twitter investor. He's been criticizing the company very quietly from his blog, criticizing them for their lack of direction. And late last week, he blogged again about how the announcement of Dick Costola's departure was, quote, sloppy and confusing. Uh, do you agree? Um, I don't know if I would classify it quite that harshly. Uh, but what I do think, and he, I think he brings up a good point, is that a big knock on Twitter basically since uh, day one has been that a lot of people don't fully understand what the service is meant to do and, and exactly how it fits into their life. So those people who have adopted Twitter, who use it every day, I think they really get it. Those are the, pro the people who love the product. They get it. But for bringing on new users, this has been a long uh, struggle for them is, is simply explaining here's what Twitter does, here's why it's valuable to you. And so I think what, what Chris has said in the past is that hey, Twitter's done a bad job of telling its own story, right? Not only from a product perspective, but to Wall Street as well, explaining here's how we're going to make money. Here's why the executive team is changing. Here's why, in this case, Dick Costolo is leaving. And so, uh, you know, he pointed out this seemed to be a, bit, a missed opportunity, right? The stock basically did not move at all when the CEO of this publicly traded company announced he was stepping down. Like, how bizarre is that, that no one even uh, reacted on Wall Street for the most part. And so I think, you know, ultimately when you make a big time decision like this, you want it to reflect positively for the company on Wall Street and it really didn't happen. So he was taking that opportunity to kind of say, hey, listen, I think that there were some things that, that maybe the company could have done to uh, frame this in a, in a better light and they didn't do that. I don't necessarily think that was a, as big of an issue as he does, but I'm also not a stockholder of Twitter. So uh, I, you know, I wasn't paying as close of attention to, to how the stock was moving. Right. I mean, it's so interesting because Chris Saka writes these really long blog posts. I mean, he basically says, this is going to be long. You're going to have to read it all if you really want to understand it. Uh, it's basically the opposite of what Twitter is. And even though he keeps saying, you know, don't just take pieces of this, uh, that's exactly what people are doing. And and it's, it just seems like he keeps poking them. Um, but I'm not really sure why. Well, I think that he cares a lot about the product. And, uh, you know, when we wrote our story, he immediately re replied to us on Twitter and said, that was the headline I knew you were going to take. I knew you were going to latch on to those words that, that I used. And, and you know, I, I responded and I just said, hey, you know, this seemed like the point of the story is that ultimately, yes, you're saying a lot of things and, and you're making a lot of points. But ultimately, this boils down to this whole notion of Twitter not being able to tell its story, as he said in the blog post before this as well. 
And so I think he just cares a lot about the product. He's obviously has a lot of financial incentive to, to, uh, to care about what Twitter's doing. And so he's making his voice heard because he can and we're going to listen and people want to know what he has to say. And, um, but yeah, at the same time, it's, it's a little tough because you can't be grumpy if uh, you know, people maybe take one or, or, or two parts of the blog post and kind of expand upon those because there is a lot to, to digest and not everyone out there wants to read as much as he's uh, willing to share right now. Right. I mean, that's why Twitter exists, right? I mean, one of the reasons. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he, you know, he's obviously a heavy Twitter user. He uses, he uses Periscope pretty well as well. He's always on Periscope. It seems like he does a lot of like, um, you know, Q and A sessions with people who want to ask him questions, but he just, you know, he cares a lot about Twitter and this is his way of showing that, I suppose. So this last week, Twitter announced a bunch of new programs or announced, or there was rumors um, that they presumably might have leaked. There were, first, there was Twitter collections, uh, new product pages. Uh, can you explain a little bit what they're trying to do with those? Sure. So Twitter has kind of dipped its toe into commerce for some time now. They've had a buy button on the site, but it really didn't, I would you know, not hold it against you if you've never seen it come across your feed. But the idea being is that here's a product. If you like it, there's a button right there. You can buy it from Twitter. And they've been testing that, and, and it's been pretty slow. And what they're doing now is they're uh, essentially creating individual pages for specific products and uh, what, what they are calling collections, which are multiple products or places that maybe an influential user, in our, uh, the case that we, the example we used was Ellen DeGeneres, maybe here's you know, 10 products that Ellen thinks are cool, and you can go to her collection and, and scroll through and see what people are saying about them, see what the prices are, where you can buy them, and then in some cases actually buy them from Twitter. So I think what it's starting to do is, A, it's expanding on that, that e-commerce test, that buy button that we were talking about, but B, it's using a lot of its information. I mean, people are talking about these products on Twitter. A lot of what they say just goes unheard. And so now this is a way for them to collect all of that, those reviews, those, those co comments on the boots or the shoes, and uh, kind of put them to use and, and maybe even sell a few products and make some revenue. So what about Twitter's other project that was rumored, Project Lightning? Uh, it's sort of a curated news feed, I think. What did you think of that? So this is something that uh, makes a lot of sense for Twitter. And, and what it is, is, and it hasn't rolled out yet, so we haven't actually seen it really in person, but um, it's essentially a curated timeline around a particular event. And so there's a lot of things that people love to talk about on Twitter, and, and a lot of them are either live TV, live sporting events, or uh, you know breaking news, for example, natural disasters or, or things of that nature. And so what Twitter's saying is, hey, you know, we're going to create seven to ten of these per day, and you're going to be able to say, oh, uh, the Oscars are tonight. I'm going to follow the specific timeline that Twitter has created for the Oscars. And they're going to use a combination of human uh, curation and algorithms to pull in all the tweets that they think you'd want to see about the Oscars. And uh, they're going to do that for multiple events every day. And that way, if you just want to simply come to Twitter and, and kind of find out what people are saying about uh, something big that's happening right there, you can. And I think it's important for two reasons. One, you don't have to have a Twitter account to see this. So they're essentially going to be getting their tweets, you know, for them, hopefully for them, in front of people who don't actually have accounts. And the second important thing is for advertisers, this is pretty intriguing, right? I mean, you have a chance to essentially put your ad alongside an event that you can maybe guess what the demographic of interested users might be. So for the Oscars, you know, you have a general idea who's going to be tuning in, who might be following all along on Twitter. Here's a chance to advertise among tweets that, that those people are going to see. So I think from a revenue and a user standpoint, it could be relatively helpful for them. Uh, obviously, we haven't seen it yet, but that's that's kind of uh, the big product that they had last week. It, it really does make sense from a user's point of view because, I mean, the way Twitter has worked in the past, you know, you have to commit to interest in something and just hope that the person tweeting doesn't, you know, tweet every five minutes. But now it's nice. It's, you know, I'm not interested in movies all the time, but I might be on the evening of the Oscars and then it can disappear. That... It sounds a little bit, and you have a piece about this, is that this project sounds a little bit like Snapchat's uh, current events feature. Uh, how do the two compare? Yeah, I do see some similarities. And so what Snapchat's doing, and, and they're making what seems to be some pretty good money from this, is they're uh, also doing some stuff around, they call it live stories, um, but essentially, it's one to two things per day, same idea. Maybe it's around the Oscars. Maybe it's around the Kentucky Derby. Maybe it's around the Super Bowl. 
but they will take snaps that their users send, videos and photos, and an actual human curator editor will sift through all these photos that people share with the company and then stitch together uh, you know, a handful of those into an, a story. Uh, you know, here's 10 seconds from user A and 10 seconds from user B. And, and uh, again, it's all around one specific event. And so if you're an advertiser, it's a pretty good opportunity to say, oh, these are people who are interested in the uh, NBA finals. So I think I know who those people might be. I'm going to uh, submit an ad to the Snapchat story and, and hopefully reach that demographic. And that's, again, uh, similar to what we just talked about that Twitter's doing. I think a big question will be how curated is Twitter's timeline going to be? Is it going to be strictly algorithm, which some you know can certainly work for a lot of things, but it's not as helpful as having an actual human being, an actual person who understands news and storytelling sitting there and uh, you know curating these tweets. And so in Snapchat's case, it seems to be all human editors in uh, uh, Twitter's case, it's still uh, to be determined, but it sounds like it's going to be a little bit more algorithm than actual human curation. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit last week. I think that's really interesting because in some ways, uh, you know, the the real person is better. But in some ways, you know, you wonder what is behind, who, you know, how much is advertising? Or is the content really separate from the advertising where an algorithm is some can sometimes be even you know, more honest in some ways in that way? Right. Well, we've also seen they've, they, it hasn't been entirely smooth um, in that case either. I remember in the past uh, there was a hashtag, and uh, I'm, I'm blanking on what the hashtag was, so I apologize. But essentially it was a hashtag that I think people were using somewhat ironically. But, of course, they were using it, and, and Twitter kind of, um, the algorithm jumped in and pulled that hashtag and, and tried to write a description for it automatically and the description was a little bit uh, pretty pretty inappropriate, actually, for the hashtag. And so it was just an example of, you know, as a human curator, you would probably read that, you'd understand the irony behind it or the context in which it's being shared that a computer algorithm, at least right now, isn't able to detect. Good point. Uh, so, no, your story about Snapchat is that they've been really successful with these Snapchat okay. stories. Is that surprising? Uh, I don't think it's totally surprising. I'll be interested to see if, three, four, five months from now, they're still having the same success because I think that a lot of people are really intrigued when there's a new ad product to throw some money at that at that ad product and see uh, what happens. I remember when they first launched their Discover section, which was a section within the app where uh, publishers were posting their content like CNN or ESPN. Uh, people were paying a lot of money. Advertisers were paying a lot of money to put their ads alongside that content. That rate has since gone way down now that it, everything's kind of settled. And I think with these live stories, you're seeing something probably similar. I think, um, you know, Snapchat's for, for one of these stories, they can make upwards of, of $400,000 for, for one story, which is, lasts for about 24 hours. And so, um, you know, that's, that's quite a good chunk of change for a 24-hour product if they're doing that every single day. Um, so I'll be intrigued to see if they can maintain the advertiser interest as they start to do more of these stories. Right now, they're only doing one or two per day. You know, if they get up to six, seven, maybe 10 per day, um, are they going to be able to find 10 different advertisers willing to spend 400 k I don't really know. Um, but that'll be that'll be something to pay attention to. Well, it's really interesting because I think a lot of complaints uh, when the Snapchat started to branch out was like, well, aren't only teenagers on Snapchat? Is anyone else on right. Snapchat? And um, obviously someone is making money somewhere. I mean, my daughter uses Snapchat. She's 12. And, you know, she told me the other day she read about something in People magazine. And, you know, she doesn't have a car. She doesn't. I said, where did you get People magazine? And she said, I read it on Snapchat, you know, and it's like she has all this access to this advertising that I had even no idea that she did, you know. So it's it's all there. And I think they they know who their audience is. They do. They, they actually shared a little bit about that because uh, Evan Spiegel is in a can right now at the uh, advertising event um, in France, and uh, they released some some metrics around their user base, and I think something like um, uh, the majority of their users are, you know, teenagers to something like 30-year-olds or maybe even 36-year-olds, but still, that's, you know, a 36-year-old is, is way different than a 16-year-old when you're an advertiser and you're going after a certain market, and the fact that they're attracting people in their 20s and 30s, I think a lot of people forget that uh, hey, there's millions of people in those demographics that are using this product too. It's not just all high school kids. Um, so, you know, in that case, there's a lot of money to be had. 
right. So uh, in other news about teenagers, uh, the other news was not really about Twitter. It did blow up on Twitter, as things often do. Over the weekend, Taylor Swift blogged about Apple not paying music owners for the first three months of the trial period of the company's new music streaming service. And today, Apple actually changed their course and said they would pay the music owners. I discussed this with Leo earlier on our iOS Today show. And I said, this seemed like a kind of pretty cut and dry offer to appease the legions of Taylor Swift fans. But he argued that it's a lot more complicated than that because the artists won't necessarily be paid, just the music owners. Uh, now, Peter Kafka, your colleague, has been updating this story all day today as it unfolded. Uh, what, what was his take? Well, I think that it, this makes a lot of sense, right? Essentially, what it seems to do is it kind of elevates Apple to the industry standard, which is that people who are creating the content deserve to be paid. And uh, I thought in uh, Taylor Swift's blog post that one of the last lines she had was something like, we wouldn't ask Apple for a free iPhone. Why is Apple asking us to give our music away for free? I thought that that was kind of clever. But, you know, it just goes to, to show you that um, – uh, I, I will say this, I will applaud Apple for moving pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's no, they don't need, the, they have the money to give to these artists. The relationships with the artists are way more important than losing uh, however much they're going to lose during this three-month trial period. Um, so I think it's great that they, that they made the change. I heard, uh, saw one rumor on Twitter that this whole thing was just like kind of a, a staged opportunity for Apple to even get like, more press around the streaming service as if it needed people paying attention to Apple any more than they already are. Um, I think that that was more maybe just a joke, but uh, I found that uh, as an intriguing conspiracy theory as well. It is intriguing. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but, yeah. you know, and just to show off how nimble a company they are, like, oh, look, like, she's right, and let's change her mind. And well, and could they have picked anyone more famous than Taylor Swift, honestly? I mean, it was pretty... Uh, fantastic that it was that she was the one because there, there does seem to that there would be very few people even in those circles of Hollywood and, and the music industry that could have an impact like Taylor Swift could but I think that you know they see what they saw what happened with Spotify and they're not so they're not stupid they know that hey uh, Taylor Swift has a lot of people she brings along with her uh, we want to be sure that uh, we're on good terms. Right. The Swifties, as we were talking before. The Swifties, yes. <laughs> well, I want someone to take her blog post and put it to lyrics because I think it would make another <laughs> excellent song for her next album. So. Yeah, maybe she'll do that. That'd be great. <laughs> well, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kurt Wagner is a reporter at Recode. He's on Twitter at KurtWagner8. Uh, you can find him on Recode.com. Where else can people find your work? Uh, yeah, Recode.net actually Recode. is the best place to... Uh, we, we throw people off at that, but Rico.net is the best place to find my work and the work of my colleagues. And you mentioned my, uh, my Twitter handle. So those are, those are the great places. Hope you guys come check it out. Thank you, Kurt. Cool. Thanks for having me. Take care. Coming up, pre-order a pebble and an app to feed the hungry. But first, this episode is brought to you by NatureBox. Right now at NatureBox, you can get a trial of their favorite snacks, and all you have to pay is $2 for the shipping. You know you're going to snack, and when you do it, you want it to be worth it. Something that's tasty and satisfying, but doesn't make you feel guilty afterwards. When you need snacks, go to NatureBox. Choose from over 100 healthy and crave-worthy options to be delivered right to your door. All their snacks are made with zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams trans fat, and no high fructose corn syrup. Best of all, they taste great. And so much better for you than other snack options out there. So next time you're hungry, grab strawberry lemonade fruit stars or sweet and salty nut medley and get smart about snacking. Right now, if you go to naturebox.com slash twit, you can get a trial of their favorite snacks delivered to your door. What are you waiting for? Go to naturebox.com slash twit to start your trial today. And we thank Naturebox for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Over the weekend, Microsoft continued to confuse people about how free the next version of Windows will be. Today, they posted another update to the story on the Windows blog. The company reiterated that Windows 10 is designed to be installed on Windows genuine devices, not people running pirated copies of the operating system. The Verge reports that the clarifications were also designed to explain that Microsoft will allow testers in the Windows Insider program to keep Windows 10 activated 
only if those testers keep opting in to future preview updates. I finally got my Pebble watch today. I think I haven't had a chance to pair it and play with it yet, but if you've been watching or listening to this show, you probably already know that I've been waiting a long time to get this Pebble. The company announced today that if you want one of your own, you can pre-order them directly from Best Buy. And I will post my review probably on Before You Buy within the next few weeks. Last week, we told you that California court had forced Uber to reclassify Uber drivers as employees, not independent contractors. Today, TechCrunch reports that on-demand grocery delivery company Instacart will willingly allow some of its personal shoppers to classify themselves as employees. Instacart recently separated the tasks of shopping and driving, and the drivers are still classified as independent contractors. The company says the difference between the two jobs is that shopping requires supervision and training, which can only be done with employees. Now, I'll admit that this logic doesn't really make sense to me. I'm not sure why drivers also don't uh, need supervision and training and shouldn't be classified as employees. But in other on-demand economy news, CNET has a piece today about Kamal Ahmed, a 25-year-old CEO of a nonprofit service called Feeding Forward. It's like Uber, but feeding for feeding the homeless. Ahmad says that the technology that powers the services that put anything at the beck and call of anyone with a smartphone can also be used for good. Feeding Forward matches businesses with extra food with nearby homeless shelters who need it. If a company has extras, they can use the app to summon a driver who will pick up the leftovers and deliver them to food banks. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can also write directly to me at Megan at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific at our new website, twit.tv. Just click on the live button. You can also go to live.twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.